Well, I said a while ago that tonight I have a certain verse on my heart that I want to preach from that, uh, and I really do hope you'll come back and, uh, and be here. I know you've got a lot going on, and Wow, that side there is past that side. That's uh, We set a new record, I think. Look at all those folks. You guys need to catch up. <laughs> so I hope you'll come back tonight. Um, but b- before I get to the heart of what I want to say this morning, I, I want to say a few other things. Words are important. And, you know, they're never more true than when you are a pastor because as a pastor, your whole life revolves around communicating. And, um, you know, whether you're trying to provide instruction or counsel or, or giving a warning or providing comfort, the right words are extremely important. The right words at the right time in the right way. And every phrase I use then is extremely important. And, uh, but, I'm telling you, when you when you are kind of in the middle of it and not an observer of it, uh, well, there are times that you'd rather not talk. You, really, you'd just rather not do anything. You'd like to just be alone with your thoughts. And uh, in, in fact, sometimes you don't even want to think. You, you just lay there and you and you wish you could turn it off, you know, and... Uh, or maybe you'd like to run away. <laughs> I'm going to take a trip and, you know, just pack up and take off. Or you wish you could go back to some more pleasant times, you know, in the past, but but you can't. Now, the reason I mentioned all of those things, the reason I, I wanted to be brutally honest with you is because I want you to know what some folks are going through they want relief, and it can't come fast enough to suit them. Uh, but then you, they, whoever it might be, realize that life has to go on. Uh, I, I really admire Brother brother Larry Jones and the, the way God has blessed him and used him and his willingness to get up and to go on and... Uh, even amid all of these treatments, and Brother Ron with his problems, my wife with her health problems, and many of you, and you just keep going. In fact, my wife has a new nickname, but I won't tell you what that is. Uh, but you just want some relief, and, 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 and it's not there. Life has to go on. Well, you know, as a pastor, you don't grieve before long, you know, because originally it was just like, come on, let's go to the room, shut the door, and you're in somebody else's house, and you just, you know, just be alone with your thoughts. But after a while, you're just busting at the seams. You want to say something. The problem is you just cannot seem to find the right words. So I, I, I mention that because I want you to forgive me if I fail to say what you want to hear or fail to say what you think you need to hear. Uh, all I can do is to try to share with you what is on my heart. Uh, all of that being said, you, you, we've got to remember why we're here. I, I was telling Tim earlier, I said, have your book open just in case that I that I start the service by singing, Brethren, we have met to worship. Might be a good time to sing that. We're not going to do it. But that, that describes why we're here. Amen. We have met to worship. And, uh, you know, doing that... You, there's no guarantee that God's going to change all of our circumstances. If your house was destroyed by the flood, I can almost guarantee you when you get home, all the mud and the filth and the dirt and the stuff will still be there. It's still a mess. The circumstances might not change, but God will change you. God will change us as a result of all of this. And let me tell you, there's no one here this morning that doesn't need a change of some kind. We all do. I'm going to do something this morning that I've never done before. 
That ought to scare you. In fact, I've never heard of anyone doing this. I'm going to make the text for the message the title of my message. Although the meaning is different, it's the same. You ought to be confused now. But I'll explain that later. For the time being, I want you to turn to the book of Job, chapter number 1. I remember when I was a little boy, and we, of course, we never went to church. wasn't much, I don't know where a Bible was around the house. wasn't much talk about church. All I knew was is that uh, my grandma on my mother's side, that uh, she was a Pentecostal holiness, and she had won a contest as a result of having a revival meeting, you know. And if you brought enough visitors, there was a great big picture mom kept all of her life you know, supposedly of the Lord that meant so much to her. Well, her mom had won that by bringing all of those visitors, and I was a—I was only a month or two old, and Grandma carried me to that Pentecostal Holiness Church and won that picture. But that's about all I knew about religion. Didn't know anything. Well, one day I heard Mom and neighbor talking, and they were standing outside chatting about something and uh, talking about their, what their favorite book of the Bible was. And I'll never forget mom saying, well, my favorite book of the Bible is Job. She could have said anything. I had no idea what Job was or anything and why, you know, that would be someone's favorite book. But several years later, whenever I got saved and began to study the Bible, all of a sudden I began to realize mom had a really good reason for identifying with this book of the Bible. And boy, I'd love to have time to enlarge upon this story. But and the reason I'm one reason I'm using is because you're familiar with it. I mean, here's a man that starts out, hey, this guy, the most righteous man in all of the land. Here is a guy that's the most prosperous person in all of the land. Seven sons, three daughters. He is rich beyond words. And all of a sudden, there's an onslaught against him. And boy, Satan just unloads and strips him of everything he's got, including his health. I mean, he is down to the bottom of the barrel. And verse number 20, then, I'm going to preach on that someday, then, I underlined it in my Bible, then, and it's important, that's a key word, then, Job arose and rent his mantle, tore his clothes, shaved his head, and fell down on the ground and worshiped and said naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord and all of this Job sin not nor charge God foolishly you know there are a lot of things in life that are uncertain but there's one thing that is certain and that is that things will change. There's no way to get around that. That's something you can't change. The God who never changes has ordained it to be that way. Change is coming. And it's always that way. Some things change, you know, that are pleasurable. And sometimes they're painful. And, uh, you know, even though, you know, we Christians, we know, well, God causes everything or God allows everything. We know that and we know that God can even use all of those things for some good. We know that, but still, regardless of how strong you think you are, it can be terribly difficult to deal with. And I'm going to be honest with you, even when you know God will help you, There is no easy way to deal with some difficulties. I mean, if it was easy, it wouldn't be difficult. Think about that for a little while. It's it's difficult. And a lot of times we expect people, you know, to uh, just slough it off like, oh, well, you know, that happened. You got to pick up and go on and just forget about it, you know, and uh, just like nothing happened. But something did happen. And we have to fight our way through those things. And, you know, family and friends rush to our aid, and uh, God bless them for that. You deeply appreciate their effort, 
And uh, it's greatly encouraging to see them coming to your aid. But it all gets down to the fact it is a personal battle that you have to fight yourself. And we, along with thousands of others in the Houston area, just experienced a, a, a great loss of things that meant a lot to us. You don't know how hard it is for me to, to, to go on beyond that statement because I'd like to itemize, you know, the things that, that I lost and things that Bev lost and what have you, but I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that because I look out there and I see other people that lost things. But we incurred a loss and, uh, you have to find a way to deal with it. And different people deal with different things in different ways and at different rates of time. There's no one size fits all when it comes to recovering from trauma. But I'll tell you one thing, it will change your perspective in a lot of ways. Not only do we learn from, uh, from these things that trouble us, It also enables us to provide comfort for others that are in need. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. The God of all comfort hath comforted us that we might be able to comfort others in their time of need. So let me share some things with you that have gone through my mind out of this experience that uh, maybe in some way God will use to be of comfort to someone else. The first thing I want to say is that although I lost a lot of things that meant a lot to me, I didn't lose the things that mattered the most. Isn't that good? Thank God for that. I didn't lose my family. I, I, did, I didn't lose any friends over this. I, I lost some possessions, but I did not lose the person that means more to me than anything in all of this world, and that's my wife. Didn't lose her. Still have my wife, and boy, you don't know how I thank God she isn't like Job's wife. (laughs) Job's wife just said, just curse God and die. Get out of your misery. Well, Brother Kenneth was right, and thank you for making mention of her, because it's not just me that's been here 30 years, it's her that's been here with me at my side for 30 years and 51 years and every step of the way, and there's no way that I would be of any use to God whatsoever were it not for her. Thank God I didn't lose that. There are some of you here today that... that, that have lost your spouse. You've gone through that suffering. And I'm so glad that God has blessed me that I haven't lost the one that is dearest to my heart. Secondly, I need to say that it could have been worse. Now, I know I know some people don't want to hear that. It could have been worse. But, you know, we all know that, but usually it's the last thing we want somebody to say when we're going through trouble. Somebody come up and hug us, you know, and say, well, I love you. It could have been worse. Well, yeah, it could have been worse, but it's bad enough. I'm the one going through it, not you. So the, the point is, I, I, I didn't lose, uh, I didn't lose everything. And I didn't lose anyone. I, I just happened to see this. This is a pen that my mother had and whenever she died. I, I, I got that. Well, I've got a lot more stuff than that. I'm, look, I'm not a superstitious person, but some of you don't even know what that is, do you, kids? Yeah, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> that was, my, my dad was... Uh, my dad was a superstitious kind of guy. I watched him throw the salt over his shoulder and all that stuff. But that's a buckeye. That was his lucky buckeye. And it was, I picked it up out of the floor wet and dried it off. And uh, I didn't lose everything. That's the point. I lost some things, but I didn't lose any one. And I didn't lose everything. I still got some stuff that means a lot to me. Not only that. 
What I lost would have eventually been lost anyway. Remember what Job said? He, he said, naked I came into this world, you know. And he said, I'm going to leave the same way. Well, in between our entrance and our exit, we experience what we call life. And we enjoy some things and we have to endure some other things. But whatever we accumulate all during that time, we're going to leave when we die. And I look, you know, it bothers us now, you know, to lose those things, right? Jason, right? Lost some stuff. Bothers you, doesn't it? Sure it does. You know, when you die, it won't bother you at all. You know why? Because you're going to something better. You're going to go to your heavenly inheritance. So we've all, look, we've all got to eventually leave this stuff anyway. And I, you know, I don't know. It might, it might be that God is just, well, trying to, trying to prepare our heart to realize how wonderful it's going to be. Like the song Bev sings, uh, needs to do it again, but that old song says, We're not home yet, children, so keep your eye upon the Savior. We're not home yet, folks. You know, you don't, look, you don't expect it to, you don't expect it to be a, a bed of roses whenever you're not home. It's after you get home, and we have a heavenly home to go to. So eventually, we would have lost all of this stuff anyway, but right now, we've got something to look forward to. Not only that, but although that we lost material things, we still have our memories. Precious memories, how they linger. You, you Look, you can't take those away. We've still got those memories. The pictures might be gone, but the memories are still here. That, I don't know about you, but that's something special to me. I, I, I can be going down the road, and, and uh, I'm normally not an emotional kind of a guy, and I don't cry easy, but you'd be amazed at the things that causes me to cry, though. We can be going down the road and driving along and listening to some 50s music and, <laughs> you know, boy, a carnal, yeah, I know. And, and I, I can start crying because I think back to the day when we were just teenagers out there on the dance floor dancing to that music. Oh, boy, if you're looking for something to, to criticize this morning, I'm giving you a wagon load. Well, help yourself. Just go right ahead. But the, the point is, those memories, I'm telling you folks, we need to thank God for those precious memories. That's not a little thing. Not only that, but I, all through this and something I've known before, but it really hits home, and that's the fact that God has a purpose. I, I, look, I, I'd be lying if I said I knew what it was. I don't, but I, I don't need to. I don't need to know the reason. All I need to know is there is a reason. And the God who cannot lie said, you know, that He would cause all things to work together for those who love the Lord or the called according to His purpose. And I, I believe God's going to keep His Word. I, I don't know how this is all going to turn out, but I'm telling you, it's going to turn out better than it was. And whenever I say that, by the way, something you need to understand about this working together for good, it doesn't always mean that it works together necessarily for your good the way you think. It might work, look, what you go through might be working good in somebody else's life in ways that you never imagined, but the good they derive from it is the result of what you've gone through and what they see in you during that time. So God has a purpose in all of this. And then one other thing that I want you to, to think about, and that is that duty is more important than desire. Uh, I said a while ago, there's a part of me that in going through this, a, a part of me that, that wants to shut everybody out, you know, and to not talk. 
not do anything. But you, you know, just let my way, let myself just grieve through it, as it were. You know, that's the way it is when people are going through depression. The thing they need the most is what they want the least. They don't want to be with anybody. They're depressed. They want to just get, you know, they, they want to curl up in a fetal position in a dark room and suck their thumb. And, you know, they, they don't want contact with anyone, but they need contact with people. But I'm just telling you that's the way you feel. And then then you begin to realize that there's something more important than what I desire. I heard the story the other day of HPD Sergeant uh, Stephen Perez. He'd been working long hours like all of our cops had. He got home for a few hours and had to go or needed to go back out on duty. His wife begged him not to go. Please go ahead and stay here. And uh, he looked at her and he said, "We got work to do." And he left. And he died in the line of duty. We got work to do. That's true of all of us, folks. We're on this earth for a reason and for a season. Jesus said the night cometh when no man can work. We don't have an unlimited amount of time to do the things that God wants us to do. And the nature of our work is so important that we dare not fail. And I hope you'll remember this. Not only must we faithfully attend to our normal, regular duties in life, don't, whatever you do, don't ever minimize the importance of being a housewife, for example. We have those normal, regular duties that we need to attend to, but we have to do that without losing our focus on our God-given mission. We can't let anything get in the way of that. And there's this ever-present danger of us losing our focus. That's why Hebrews 12, verse 2 is so important. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I mean, look, we've got to do that if we're going to survive in this troubled world. We have to focus on what we have instead of what we lost. And I know that's easier said than done. Because although what we have outweighs what we lost, you don't get over it overnight. And and, and those of you that didn't lose anything in this need to understand that about those who did suffer loss. They don't get over it overnight. Recovering from any kind of a trauma takes time. And so those of you that are doing it, let me tell you, you need to expect it to take time. And don't feel guilty about it. If you feel like going in a dark room and just laying down on the bed and crying your eyes out for 30 minutes, help yourself. That's your right. That's a part of the process. I can't tell you as a pastor how many times I've seen people lose someone they love and they go through the funeral service. Boy, they like you, as they say, like a trooper. Man, they, they're just, they're not going to shed a tear. They're brave and, you know, they're going to celebrate the life. The loved one is in heaven and then two weeks later they crash and burn. God never intended for you not to grieve when you've gone through heartache. But you need to remember this, as long as you have life, you can make something of it. You've suffered a loss, but all isn't lost. In fact, there's some things that could be gained from that loss. We've all heard the old saying, you know, the darker the night, the brighter the light. How true that is. Look, this is our time to shine. As Christians. And instead of us looking at all of the obstacles that are in our way, we need to think of this as an opportunity and turn our our stumbling blocks into stepping stones. You listen? 
I want you to turn Job 1 into Job 1. That's the text and that's the title of the message. Job 1 is the text. The title of the message is Job 1. And let me tell you that our greatest duty, our highest privilege is to worship God. And we can't let anything stop us from that. Nothing is more important than that. Look, worship is not the only thing that is important, but it's more important than anything. In fact, if you really study Romans chapter number 12, you see that worship is actually a lifestyle that we live. And if you really understand the word worship, you'll, you'll realize that by implication it has to do with, with offering to serve. Somebody says, well, I think working for the Lord's more important than, wor- than worshiping the Lord. Look, you can't do either. Worship is the springboard for our work. Work is involved in the true worship of the Lord. And there's so many times, you know, that we don't see the connection between the two. We've got people that will go to the gate, there's all night singing, and, and sit up all night long worshiping the Lord, but then they're not in church the next morning. They're not out here on visitation or they're not helping mop up after a flood. They're not serving God in any way. You can't separate the two. And whenever the Bible talks about loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of those other verses, it all gets back to the matter of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's job one. And I'm telling you, if we fail there, we're going to fail everywhere. The very first message I preached over at Northway Baptist Church was entitled, The Work is Great. And I'm sorry to say that I didn't put the emphasis upon the matter of worship as I should have, but I was speaking about the work, the, you know, the, what we'd call the hard stuff, the, back-breaking sweat and the work of getting the gospel out around the world and what have you and so forth. The work is great. Let me tell you, it still is. And we must never let our troubles distract us from what matters most. And there's always something trying to stop us. It might be our worries. Well, Satan has a field day with some people about this matter of worry. We get worried about this and we're nothing's wrong. We're just worried about it. And we just stop. Or it might be our work. We let our work get in our way of our worship of God. Or it might be our weariness. And 40, 11 other things that we could mention that get in the way of us actually worshiping God as we should. We can't afford that, folks. The work is great. And we've got to, we've got to make that job number one. Regardless of what else we do, we've got to keep that at the forefront on top of the list. I heard somebody say, speaking about the recovery, and they were saying this in a positive way, and I know, you know, they meant it as an encouragement to someone. They were talking about things are going to get back to normal. And my first thought was, God forbid. I don't want things to get back to normal. I want this experience to make me and you and everybody else better. And the only way it's better is if it draws us closer to the Lord. So let me close by saying, folks, rather than looking at at all of this as the end, I want you to consider the end. I want you to think about being a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ and realizing that for you, the best is yet to come. Boy, you go to the last chapter of Job. And verse number 12 says, listen to this. And the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. More than his beginning. Let me tell you, it is 10,000 times more true of a Christian than it was of Job. Because he was talking there basically about children and prosperity and things of that nature. God gave him back all he lost and more than he lost. 
But when you think about being a joint heir with Jesus Christ, there's no way to measure the glory that awaits you as a child of God. So when you think this is the end, remember this, the best day of a Christian's life is his last day. Because then we're going home. All of the sorrow and the suffering, all is going to come to an end. And there in the presence of the Lord, we'll enjoy our inheritance. Don't let anything come between you and the worship of God. Now, I've spent all of this time basically talking about needs and God's ability to meet those needs in very unusual ways. But that's what we've been talking about. But let me tell you, the neediest person here, you know, some of, some of you, boy, you, you just had a wipeout. Lost every stick of furniture, all, all your stuff. It's, it's all gone. For others, you know, there's an inch or two of water and you can mop it up and take off a little sheetrock and you're right back in business. So different degrees of loss. But let me tell you, if we took those that lost the most and put them all together over all of the Houston area, they would not be nearly so needy as that one person that is here in this service this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is the neediest person in all of the world. And nobody but Jesus can meet that need in your life. He can and He will. And I beg you this morning, don't leave here without Him. You can't afford to make that mistake. And I don't know this morning, if you're here and you're a Christian, and if nothing else, I want you to pray that God help me, to keep me, Lord, from becoming bitter and, and help, help all of this experience to make me better, that I might be that bright light in the dark night for some lost soul. While we all stand together, Tim's going to come and our musicians, we're going to sing a verse of invitation.